Double, triple, some will pay. I'm not going to work on Saturday. I'm not either going to work on Saturday. It's Shabbos Kaidash. Oh, we're live now? And if you're listening oh, to this. Oh, you do that uh, with the guests. Yeah. And you did that now too? Good for you. You know what? I think we're on a record. Welcome back. We're singing a lot of songs at the beginning of these episodes. Um, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Meaningful People Podcast. We're so happy to have you here. Welcome back. We got an episode for you. But first, we want to mention that the Be Kind week right? begins Tonight, October 22nd, and we got ourselves some swag. This is the wrong way. We got ourselves, give me a drum roll, Momo, with your mouth. We have Be Kind sweatshirts. Um, we got nice quote on the sleeve. We got magnets, wristbands. Nice quote on the sleeve. What does the quote say? We rise by lifting others. We do rise by lifting others. We do rise. We should have made the quote, we do rise by lifting others. <laughs> So anyway, be kind. Yeah, so be kind. Anyways, you can get all this And rise swag. by lifting others. Sure, you can. Um, you can get all this swag on MeaningfulMinute.org. There's a lot of content there as well. We're just trying to paint the world with kindness. Meaningful Minute is mm. changing our branding this week for this thing, just to just raise awareness. You it's know, such a nice initiative. I feel like the school year is like re-upping right now. And like this is the long stretch of the school year yeah. for kids. But even if you're an adult and you're in the workplace, you know, just... Uh, just be kind. Be kind. That's all we're trying to say. Um, we sat down this week with Dr. Henry Abramson, who is an historian. You might think, oh, history. I hated history in high school. I'm going to skip this episode. Let me tell you something. I thought so also, but I was sitting here, so I couldn't skip it. And let me <laughs> tell you, I was very, very happy I didn't skip it because it was so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He's really, really fascinating character. Um, really cool just start to his career. You don't typically picture historians starting as ski instructors. No, certainly not. Rocking out the slopes. Yeah. Um, but he really brings a fresh perspective to the study of history. Uh, the topics that he delves into is is truly fascinating. Certainly the coolest historian I've ever spoken to. Right? Maybe the only historian also. No, I, I think I spoke to, I spoke to a barrel wine. He's an historian, I think. Yeah. Anyways, hope you enjoy this episode. But first, we want to speak about our friends at J Karaoke. J Karaoke, right? J Karaoke.com. You ever like sitting at home with your family? Maybe it's like Hanukkah time because that's coming up. Or maybe it, it's before Hanukkah time. Maybe it's like Thanksgiving time. You maybe know? it's like right now. Maybe it's like tonight. And you're sitting there and you're like, guys, you know, I want to do some karaoke. But I don't want to sing this non-Jewish nigunim mm. that they have in these karaoke. Hey, look no further. You have J Karaoke. They have Jewish karaoke. If you want to sing, thank you. It, thank you, Hashem. Oh, is it's it, Hashem. Okay. Yes, thank it you. is on. Actually, it's on their. I, I went on their website, jkaraoke.com, yeah. um, and we browse some of like the popular songs. Yeah. And it's right up there. It's Thank really incredible. And you can subscribe monthly for just four ninety nine or yearly from fifty dollars and in honor of their US launch, J Karaoke are now offering their they best started in London. Yeah, they're offering their best deal yet. You ready? Grab a yearly subscription plus karaoke kit for just ninety nine dollars. And if you use coupon code JK Minute, you get ten percent off. JK Minute. JK Minute. That's all caps, JK Minute. That's ten percent off. So go ahead, head to jkaraoke.com. And get yourself a Jewish karaoke machine. Your kids will thank you for it. And I'm genuinely excited about being able to do this. I think we're with gonna my family. We're gonna we're gonna just do karaoke one episode with our guests. We're gonna have a gay karaoke segment. Interesting. And we're just gonna do like a random song, and boom, we're gonna just karaoke it. That sounds fun. Let's do it. But first, head to jkaraoke.com. Remember promo code JK Minute, and you'll get yourself ten percent off. We hope you enjoy this episode. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. Dr. Abramson, I'm just very excited to be able to pronounce this to pronounce this word right. Iroquois Falls. Correct. Well done. You're born and I was sitting there before and I'm like, it's spelled like Iroquois. <laughs> but Iroquois Falls, you know, in Canada, it's got to be pronounced differently. So I go on Google and I hit that little button that pronounces it for I you. Know, I'm like, I okay, I got it. Well, you grew up in Iroquois Falls. What's the, the Jewish population like there right now? I mean, then, now. Uh, when I was born, the Jewish population was three. and um, You were four or three? Uh, no, we were three. Oh, and wow. And it was uh, my father, my mother, and myself. Wow. Wow. And, uh, and when my father was born, the population was probably in the vicinity of um, about 25. There's actually a photograph in the Ontario archives of the shul in Iroquois Falls, which was just down the street from where I grew up. In fact, the street was called Synagogue Street because once they sold it to make a regular house, 
they at least kept the name in the street. And the, in the photograph that includes my uh, my grandparents, Aliyah Mashalom, there's about 20 Jews there. Wow. Yeah. So that's the, a big impact on the population when you were born, when you hit the scene. Uh, well, no, don't forget, the, the, let's get the, the timing right. That photograph is dated about 1920, and I know I got a lot of white hair, but not quite <laughs> that old. I was born in the 1960s, and, and by then there were no Jews left. Wow. What, so what's it like now in Erika Falls? Uh, pretty much exactly like it was when I was growing up. So uh, well, actually worse, because the, the thing about the town is it's a single industry town, and it's a paper mill. Oh, and okay. that's what attracted a lot of people to that part of the world. And uh, with the internet mm -hmm. that has given us tremendous things like Meaningful People podcasts and things mm -hmm. like that, it also led to a tremendous decline in the need for newsprint. So one by one, the seven paper machines shut down and the town went into decline. People had to move away. And uh, so there's only about uh, three, 4,000 people living there now. Wow. I think we should... I think, I mean, like North Women could take off. I think Iroquois Falls could take off, no? Yes. If parts of North Lawrence are booming right now, let's bring back Iroquois Falls. <laughs> All right, that's our next ad on Meaningful People. Um, something that is very impressive, that you have 68,000 YouTube subscribers, and you're talking about history. Yeah, I know, that's weird, isn't it? It just shows you how important history really is to people. I know, but, you know, some people might say, you know, history is, especially nowadays, younger people, like, History might not be the most exciting subject for people, but you found a way to approach it in a very fun, contemporary way. I, I, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm just talking about things that interest me, and uh, I'm glad that other people share it. I, I really believe that history as a subject is its the best subject. Like It's the easiest subject. It's the most interesting subject. It is unfortunately taught atrociously most of the time, and people think that history is just an agglomeration of dates and places, and, oh, i got to memorize all these names of kings and stuff. That's ridiculous. It's full of fascinating stories of people and their challenges and their, you know, uh, hopes and aspirations and fears, and, and just exploring that is, is fascinating. That is fascinating. And we'd love to hear how you sort of came into this as a, as a profession, I, I understand it wasn't your first stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you might have stopped on the ski slope, ski slopes for a minute. Yeah, that's true. Have, no. you, have you ever skied? You know something? I I grew up in California. Oh, so no. And <laughs> so skiing wasn't such a thing. And when I got married, my wife, who grew up in Europe, she would go to Switzerland with her family since she was three years old and was in ski school. And they were they would like were skiing before they were running. So. <laughs> We have that in common because my wife's also a ski instructor. And in fact, that's how we met. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So you asked if I'd ever gone skiing. And so when we got married, my wife's like, you better go learn how to ski, right? So when we were living in Israel at the time and we went to like the one place, Mount Hermon, where you can ski. Yeah. And my brother-in-law, God bless him, Rafi Frankel, he's like, yeah, I'll take you to the slope. I'll teach you how to ski. No problem. And we sit down on the ski lift and we start going up the mountain. And, you know, Mount Hermon for skiers is not all that intimidating. But for someone who had never been on a ski slope, I just turned to him innocently. I'm like, Rafi, wouldn't it be smarter to keep, like, the bunny slopes at the bottom of mm. the mountain? Like, why, why, why are we going all the way up here? He's like, yeah. So about that, the only way you're going to get down this mountain is by learning how to ski really quick. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never been skiing. Never. Wow, we got to get you a coffee, coffee on the skiing. top of a ski slope. <laughs> and that, by the way, those go, go great together. Get coffee, a ski slope, okay. <laughs> Ritz uh, bucket list that. You know, do you mind, uh, can I ask you a personal favor? Sure. And, and you know, we can cut this out. We don't sure. have to include it all. Or but, we can not cut it out. But you reminded me of my wife, and she always likes to see how I look wearing other people's glasses. Really? <laughs> yeah. Could I try your glasses? Sure. On? I think your glasses are fantastic. That For is sure. that is try that Momo's out. trademark. Let's see what that looks like. I just won't be able to see how it looks, but I'll I'll watch it on YouTube. Well, well, you got to put on his glasses. Like, oh, I mean, you don't have to similar put them on my description. Okay. What do you think? Okay, let me see. You look great. Thank you. You really I do. Think I you mean, look my fantastic. God. <laughs> let me see. You look good. Very, very good. Uh, come on. I, it turns I, out we're not the same uh, prescription. Not too far away. <laughs> so. You've got, I've got trifocals there. So I think I, you know. this makes you look very professory. You know, no? that's my I wife. I think he looks fantastic. My wife wants me to go with round glasses, actually. So, um, okay. I don't know. But should I do the rest of the interview like this or? <laughs> Could you no? see? 
Um, I might get a headache from the, <laughs> All right, from the distortion great. of the. But thank prescription. you. I really appreciate that. That was that was. A, of course, you have to. Even if we don't include that, you got no, that's so clip included because you know honestly, there's not many times that's ever happened before. Like none, but like, <laughs> that happened l less amount of times than the people who grew up in Iroquois Falls. <laughs> well, actually, we have this thing in Iroquois Falls that we try each other's. Yeah, no, that's a thing. <laughs> okay, so uh, do you want to hear the story of the ski? Sure. I mean, like, yeah, ski instructor to PhD to dean to doing history. Yeah, ski instructor. Like, so, so it's like this. I'll give you the short version. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I was always really engaged with questions of identity since I was a little kid. I mean, I was the only Jewish kid growing up in this small town. Um, it was uh, about 50% uh, Francophone Catholic and about 50% Anglophone uh, Protestant. And the, the two major groups tended to fight each other quite a bit. It's, it's quite far north and close to the Quebec border. And uh, there, were, there were only three kids who didn't fit. There was me, there was my best friend, Peter Chin, who was Asian. And uh, there was a black girl from Monteith that I didn't hang out with, but she used to come in on the bus. And the three of us were like the only kids that didn't fit in town at all. Peter wow. Chin and I were in the same grade, so we were quite close. Is it because you guys were, I imagine, because you're minorities? Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, Peter was a visitable minority as Asian. And because it's a small town, I mean, smaller than the five towns, mm -hmm. everybody knows everybody. And, uh, you know, like to like an example of that, uh, my father, Oliver Shalom, was a uh, you know, small businessman. He had a clothing store, Shmata dealer, he used to call it. Uh -huh. And uh, before credit cards um, were big, uh, I remember that the way they used to um, do business is that people would come in, including like workers from the mill or trappers would come in from the bush and they would come in, they want to buy some work boots or some thermal underwear or something like that. And they don't have any credit cards or anything, they don't have any money. So they talked to my dad, who everybody knew, and um, they would, um, my dad would say, okay, so what's your name? And he'd say, you know, Cournoyer. He says, oh, are you related to the Cournoyer from Matheson? He'll say, oh, yeah, yeah. And Jacqueline was my mother. He said, oh, yeah, sure, I know your mother. And as soon as they did the, the geography, because everybody knew everybody, then my dad would give them credit. they just write it down on a little ledger, and uh, the guy would sign it, and they'd put the ledger in the safe. That was the only thing we had in the safe. There was no money in there. And uh, eventually they would pay. And if they didn't pay, then my father would call his mother <laughs> and say, hey, your son came in. And, uh, you know, so that was a very effective... before bridge credit solutions could yeah. come in. Just call their mom. Oh, well, there it is. We great. Did, we just yeah. saved ourselves having to do an ad at the end. So <laughs> there we go. We're all so, about efficiency here. Uh, so the, anyways, uh, I always was, you know, being Jewish was something that fascinated me. It was very problematic. I kept on getting beat up over it. So I wanted really? to know what exactly does it mean you know, to get Jewish, to be Jewish. And, um, you know, I had a, a very limited Jewish education at the time, although my parents went to tremendous lengths to give me something of an education. Um, so when I got to college, I went to University of Toronto. I fell in with the Jewish philosopher Emil Fackenheim, who was uh, really quite a brilliant mind. And um, I became something of his protege. I went to Israel to study under him in Hebrew University and... Um, there's a long story about how we eventually had a falling out. It took a dozen years to patch together kind of a 19th century sort of a dispute between professor and student. And I decided, okay, I have a degree in philosophy. I am going to become a ski instructor. <laughs> the, yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, and then um, what happened was I was actually planning to, like, I really love skiing. I found tremendous meaning in skiing. I, I it was deeply fulfilling to me. And, and, um, I was determined I was going to ski year round. I was going to ski in the winters in Canada and in the summers in New Zealand. And uh, it was like I was living the dream. That's commitment. That's right a there. cool decision to make. Oh, yeah. I was. You, you, you had mentioned you found meaning in the skiing. I'm yeah. curious, besides your being fulfilling and, and doing something that you loved, what, what meaning did you find in that? Oh, my gosh. This is going to be a long interview if I really get into it. <laughs> get into it. You know, Listen, we already switched the glasses, so this is just a natural <laughs> progression of things. Okay, so this is a tangent. I do want to get back to it because sure. it's a cool story, I think. Of course. But, um, you know, I, I, I taught racing. I taught uh, instructional, you know, like recreational skiing and so on, competed a little bit. But the best kind of skiing I did was I taught disabled skiers. Wow. Um, so we taught, um, you know, like, for example, amputees or people with cerebral palsy or the best was blind skiers. Wow. And the, the methodology that we use in the Canadian Ski Instructors Alliance is you, um, 
you have to mimic their disability and learn how to ski the way they would learn how to ski. So for example, wow. if you had a above the knee amputee, a below the knee amputee, you'd have to like put a brace on your other leg, strap your legs together at a different height, and then ski on one ski and figure out what that's like and figure incredible. out how to master wow. And then once you learn how to ski like them, then you can teach them. That right? is incredible. So that whole idea of getting into someone else's physical experience of the universe. Such musser. It is. That's it's such huge. Muscle. Baruch Hashem. Wow. See, now you said earlier you like to surround yourself with people more intelligent than you. That's really challenging. It's going to be a very difficult thing because that <laughs> was really a smart not. thing. But no, getting into the mind and the body of another person and seeing how they appreciate the universe is huge. And when you get to blind skiers, where blind skiing is actually pretty scary. How do you do it? You know, as an instructor, you would blindfold yourself yeah. and you have a guide behind you saying, uh, watch out for that tree, <laughs> or a whole bunch of people on your left. And all of a sudden, you know, you, you can't rely on your eyes, which are so essential for our appreciation of the universe. You've got to start hearing the snow. You've got to start feeling the vibrations and, and seeing what part of the ski are feeling, is feeling the ice or feeling the powder. You've got to be much more sensitive to your center of gravity. You know, it's, it's a deep, meaningful artistic experience like dance so i was totally yeah, into it i, I love was, this tangent by the way that is that is that is amazing okay so i'm going to bring it back to yeah, reality let's bring it, let's bring it back what home. happened was uh, i met my wife who's also an instructor and uh, i thought she was fantastic and everything was great i had not at the time asked her to marry me though um because i still wanted to do new zealand right she had different life trajectory and i wanted to do new zealand but then i had um uh, training for a race, I had a really serious accident where, you know, we use these bamboo poles called gates that you would ski around them, right? And I saw them. I caught a tip at the top of a flush, which means there's like a, about six of them in a row straight down the hill. And I broke them, you know, bamboo poles over my right thigh as I was like going through them about 20, 30 miles an hour. It was like a broken femur situation? A femoral artery. Oh my gosh, so, that's dangerous. Yeah, it was super dangerous. The the wow. femoral artery, because I'm wearing these... It's main artery, in the, it's like one of the main arteries. Yeah. yeah, you can bleed out within a few minutes. Yeah. But Baruch Hashem, it was really an incredible story of Hashkacha, in my humble opinion, that uh, because I'm wearing these padded ski pants, and they're like high compression ski pants, the artery burst on the inside, but uh, the skin didn't burst on the outside. So my, my legs swelled up, like incredible size. Uh, but by the time I had gotten to the hospital, they, uh, they said that the, uh, the wound is already, you know, sealed up from the internal pressure of the bleeding. I mean, wow. I, so I was in a wheelchair for six months and um, I had to uh, reevaluate New Zealand. Cause that how, was how old that, were you at this time? Uh, about 22. Oh, wow. uh, so I guess close to your age, I'm guessing. <laughs> That's a big compliment. I'm yeah. 27, though. Oh, 27, <laughs> sorry. But I had I lots when of I was coffee 22. by then. You did? Yes, lots of coffee. By <laughs> I feel like there's so much more I left to experience right. in my life. It's so interesting how we, we refer to these occurrences as accidents. Yeah. But with the hindsight of, with the, with the luxury go. of hindsight, yeah. you can see how it truly changed the right. trajectory of your life. Absolutely, because my wife started visiting me in the hospital, and my wife started, uh, you know, we spent a lot more time together, and I realized, wait a second, my priorities, as much as I love skiing, uh, you know, this is th my future. And uh, so then I invested in the rest of the story, of course, is, is pretty obvious. But um, to, to take it back to your original question, which is about why history, yeah. um, I realized that if I was going to marry this woman, make my future with her and have kids with her, how would we ever pay for day school education <laughs> if I was a ski instructor? Especially, I wasn't even sure if I'd be able to ski afterwards. I wasn't even sure if I could walk afterwards. So um, I, w I thought back to my university experience as an undergraduate. And I, I made, my wife doesn't actually like me to tell this story, but, you know, we've already changed classes. And yeah. I doubt she'll listen this far into the podcast <laughs> anyway. So um, uh, I remembered my philosophy teachers and I remembered my history teachers. And my history teachers all wear suits. And I figured they must make more money. Mm, nice. And I thought, okay, history history is okay. I really liked, I realized what I liked about philosophy really was the history of ideas. I liked seeing how ideas changed over time and people approached the world differently, saw the world differently, very much like how I appreciated other skiers and understanding how they appreciated the hill. 
I, I saw how people appreciated time and space. And so I went back to, to college, um, got my degrees and postdocs and things like that. There you go. That's pretty cool. It's a pretty dra- drastic career change. Like, you mean from history to philosophy to history or from <laughs> ski instructor? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I mean, like, was it, did you find it to be, did you, did you find the, the meaning in that change for you? I mean, I imagine doing the skiing is a very physically accomplishing and fulfilling and, and as well emotionally and spiritually, as, as you mentioned, to sort of, you know, I equate it to someone who's maybe working on site with their hands and feet to them working a nine to five behind a desk. Well, it is an, uh, also a very sophisticated question. Um, you know, there is a tremendous amount of art and aesthetic to skiing, and there's a great depth to it, absolutely. As with any, you know, uh, artistic endeavor that involves uh, an immediate um, and unmediated experience of the world. But history, and especially the question of Jewish history, that's, these are the adult leagues. This is when we think about why are we here at all? What is our point? What? Why should I be Jewish? How do I deal with the fact that there's some Jews that don't live up to the ideals that I really um, identify with? Mm-hmm. You know, those are those are really important questions that every thinking Jew should ask. And I I was so fortunate that I got to spend all day thinking about those things, and someone would pay me to do it. Mm. So that's really why history is is fantastic. Philosophy is still pretty cool. Yeah, um, but history is so much more grounded and meaningful. Like you can actually look at people's stories and say, okay, this is how this person solved that dilemma. Maybe it's useful for me. Right. I, I, Nahi, we heard Nahi compliment you for bringing history to today's generation in an engaging and an interesting way. And I think you're revealing some of how you do that with that underlying philosophical thread that you have within you and bringing it to application in actual practical ways over the span of history that's really kind of you to say that but i'm actually quite confused right now because when i listen to these podcasts to prepare for this interview you're usually the guy who cracks like these amazing jokes but <laughs> you're like saying these straight up deep philosophical ideas too so we'll get there we'll get there. we're gonna get a third person in here yes i'm gonna okay. have to i'll show you wanna <laughs> Um, yeah, so that, that is, that is really incredible that, that whole switch, but you know, something that is extremely popular nowadays is the, the history that you give on the DAF. Oh yeah, that's fun. And, you know, I guess explain a little bit of, of, for those who don't know what, what it is, what, what you do. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a strange project. I, I balked at it when it was first suggested to me, but I, I gave it. A chance because um, Rabbi Yaakov Trump uh, is is my rav and mm-hmm. uh, and he thought it was a really cool idea so I went for it and I'm really grateful to uh, have listened to him for this. Basically, the um, the OU has this amazing new app they created for Daf Yomi called Al Daf. The uh, the genius behind it is Rabbi Moshe Schwed, who is a phenomenal individual. And I think he's far more deserving of sitting in this chair than I am. I think you really would learn some amazing things from him. God willing. Uh, and so uh, Rabbi Schwed approached me and said, we would like you to do something on history and the Daf. And we, we know for sure that a lot of Jews find it difficult to connect to their Judaism through texts like the Gemara. Uh, and although there, you know, we have 50,000 downloads on this particular app, so people are really appreciating it. But the Gemara itself, it, it's brilliant and amazing and phenomenal and, and, and entertaining for people who have acquired a taste for it, like coffee. Yeah. But uh, that's going to be the theme, I think. Of it this. is. It's the theme of my life. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know how many people come over me in the street like, hey, you want to go for a coffee? Because they heard on an episode <laughs> that I don't drink coffee. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, let's go. But, but it's a good example because the thing is you have to learn to like coffee. The first 10 times you taste it. I'm starting to think maybe that I don't have that like skill of wanting to learn new things at this age. Is that possible? Uh, well, yes, but I don't know if, if you want to discuss that online. <laughs> I mean, you want to like... <laughs> and to me, Dean Therapist, like it's, it's all the same. <laughs> it's like a cousin industry. Oh. Um, so uh, Rabbi Schwed approached me 
<clears throat> and he said, we want you to do something. And I said, no, this is ridiculous. I mean, the daf, the way it works, I'm, you're familiar with Kamara. You know how it's like a transcript of a, a bizarre bit familiar. He conversation. Went to Philly Shiva, so like he's... So <laughs> it, the daf goes on like tangent after tangent after tangent after seven, eight pages. Suddenly you say goofa and you got to come back to the main <laughs> subject. And you're like, what kind of... It, it's like a bizarre kind of like extended conversation with 400 people. So how, how am I going to write history on the DAF. Right. But nevertheless, you know, he, he convinced me that there was a, some value to it. And I started looking at the DAF. We were, this was way back three years ago, I think. Uh, we were coming up to Bechoros. That's when we started. And um, I started saying, okay, look, you know, we could do biographies of these rabbis. And, oh, like, here's a reference to some realia. Some, like, they describe, like, for example, uh, I have all, uh, maybe, I probably have the world record of uh, descriptions of um, you know, plumbing in mm. the ancient world because there'll be a reference to, uh, you know, Asher Yatsar or something. And then I've got to say, well, this is how it was done and this is where it was done. And this is, you know, the way in which people dealt with their business. And, and all of a sudden there was more and more fascinating little tidbits that were bite-sized, like two to five minutes that I could talk about something small in the Gemara that, that uh, you know, lends light on, you know, how this whole conversation works. Like, for example, what is a cistern? How does a cistern work, right? You know, and so just describing it and using the internet to show pictures of them, archaeological discoveries, you know. Uh, it turns out that a huge number of people use my history podcast as kind of a parperis lechachma, like they'll study the daf, and then, you know, they really work through it, and then for a little bit of dessert, they go and they listen two minutes about uh, who was Ima Shalom, for example. Nice. My, my mother-in-law, she actually loves listening to your stuff. Oh, and, thank you. You know, she had mentioned to me, like, oh, you need to get him on because it's, it's really interesting, really interesting. And I it, think it was also cool about what you're doing, in addition to the dessert factor, but, you know, in today's day and age, there's so much content out there, and I think the lines can get blurred between what is history yeah. and what is a muscle and what is a story and you're illustrating that these these accounts that are that we find in the Gemara, these things really happen. And these are real personalities that existed, that lived a certain way, and, and you're really bringing that to the generation. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm, I'm hoping it's a contribution. I, I do find it's interesting. Uh, occasionally people write to me and they say that they have, uh, you know, they find the Gemara too hard, but they're making a seum on my Jewish history, <laughs> po- Jewish and Dafyomi Paskin, so... Can't have uh, meat during the uh, nine days if that if that's what the oh, yeah. is. Maybe that's what, yeah. <laughs> it's a, interestingly, <laughs> I got a I got a book sent to me recently by JLI. Um, the name of the book is the Book of Jewish Knowledge, and it's a textbook. Kolach, I think. Alfred Kolach is the author. Perhaps, yeah. yeah. It's <clears throat> it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Sure. And growing up as a I guess a boy in yeshiva. Maybe girls learn this more, but just sort of like his, you know hysteria. Like my wife can name every generation from Noah, other everyone, and I'm just like Yosef, Abraham, Yaakov, Yitzchak. Yeah, like, that's it. You know, and I and I open this, I open up this this book, and I just like fell in love with understanding and learning about our lineage, the people that we come from, and and especially when it comes to, let's say, Meaningful Minute with the content we're trying to produce, one of the things that we're trying to focus on is highlighting people in the Torah who maybe, you know, aren't highlighted so much in, 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 in places. Maybe Shlom Tzion, like, yeah, Elvin, yeah, sure. what, what's your story? And that's why I, found so, I find so interesting what you do is to sort of learn more about these people that maybe aren't so talked about. Yeah. I'm curious, which personality in the Torah or Tanakh, or wherever that you have learned about and have uncovered, and said, you know, this is one of the more interesting stories that I've that I've researched. Wow, uh, that that's a really hard question. <clears throat> so many of them are, I find deeply fascinating, and, um, and and provide me with a lot of personal motivation. I often meditate upon them. Um, one of my favorites, though, is a, not, uh, certainly a well-known figure is Abaye. Okay, and, and what I like. Uh, about Abaye so much are two things. Um, first of all, that that fascinating exploration of his growing self understanding that you find in uh, Sukkah Daf Nun Beis, where he um, it, it, that that's like a bizarre Gemara. I don't know if we should discuss it here, but you can look it up and you'll see 
where he discovers something dark about himself. We just did some major Harbatas Torah because everyone is so curious. They're about to open up Nun and Sukkah right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's the Yetzir Hara Daf. Okay. It's, it's the whole thing about the Yetzir Hara. And the, the other thing I love about him is, of course, he, and this I find deeply meaningful for myself as well, he argues thousands of times in Shas, primarily with Rava, his Chabrusa, mm-hmm. and... Um, he loses every single argument except for six that are really? so famous, of course, that they yeah, have Al-Kagam. their own. Yeah, Al Kagam. That's it exactly. This is, this is like a high level interview. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Al Kagam, I'll, I'll they're, make they're, the, I know what you guys are talking about. Al Kagam is an acronym for all the instances in which we paskin like Abaya. Yeah, the so six times he it, wins. Why is it that? What do, like what don't I know about Abaye that it's like yeah he won six times out of thousands like that? Can you imagine? They 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 say that his name is recorded. At least once in every four pages of Shas, and he so, was and he was and he was batting like <laughs> a, a average of less than a hundred, and he keeps on getting up and coming back to the argument, and and not only that, he's mentioned the Gemara so yeah, often, o- over and over and over and over again, and like I just look at say, my gosh, if I feel like downtrodden and beaten and uh, not valued and things like that, imagine a Baye. Goes yeah. into the base measures, loses every every single day except for six. Yeah, you know, and that's why we have the special yeah Al Kagam acronym. Remember the six times that Abaye was right. It's a lesson. Not that he was wrong yeah, all the time, like, but I meant that he was, that he won the argument. Yeah. It's a lot like married life, I think. Yeah, like I, I was just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, six times. We're gonna pretty, cut that out, right? Probably not. <laughs> You know, it's, I was discussing with my wife recently, and we're working on like a whole line of, of merch for Meaningful Minute and Meaningful People. And one of the things that we stumbled upon, a, a line that we were able to relate to in life, is just show up, you know? Oh, yeah. And it seems like a buy just showed up. Yeah, 100%. And it doesn't matter, right, wrong, just show up, and, and look what happens from showing up. Yeah. We're speaking about him here in 2022 on Meaningful People. Because he showed up. Yeah, absolutely. And he pushed the argument further. He wouldn't let it go. He says, like, I don't quite understand. I'm going to argue my point until I understand that, that I am wrong and you are right. I mean, how many people can do that? How many people don't just give up? It's wild. Yeah. I think it's worthy to point out also the concept that we believe in, which is Elu Elu Divra Likim Chaim. Yeah. Which means even though we may not paskin like Abaya in the way we practice halacha, there is an aspect of MS to his opinion as well. 100%. Absolutely. Hillel and Shammai, same kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually have a colleague at, uh, at Toro University uh, named Shammai Bienenstock, mm-hmm. and uh, we frequently argue. And really? So it's always, no, I mean, we in a joking way. Well, who's the Abai? Yeah. Well, no, I'm the Hillel. Oh, Hillel's okay. my Hebrew name, <laughs> and he's Shammai. So, oh, 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 so okay, it's always okay. a running joke. Okay. You know, we paskin like Hillel because he's the dean. Right. right. <laughs> nice. But uh, Shammai's a great person. And, I, uh, I had heard some, I had heard some, uh, it, vaguely, I heard some story about was it Rava maybe that when it came time for the Malachamabas to to take him, they had an issue because you're not they weren't uh, allowed to take him while he was learning. Yeah, and he never stopped. Rav is that yeah? It, there's actually several. There's about half a dozen rabbis who fall into that categories, and the the the, the, um, the Malachamabas has to find a way to distract him or in Mark the case, stuff, Yud, I think it is. Uh, I think it's, all, it's Yud, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure offhand. <laughs> but uh, Yehuda Nasi also, you know, like uh, it, it, different rela- different terms, uh, the people were davening for him and uh, they were keeping him from dying. And so his uh, his maid threw a pot off the roof to distract them for a second. They said, what's that? And then that's when the Malach was able to take him. Wow. Yeah. That's so that's so amazing. You know, I was something I was, I was discussing because I, I delved into this book of Jewish knowledge. I was talking about my wife and I was really distraught over was we know that, you know, in the times of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, there is 600,000 Jews that, that left Mitzrayim. Is that correct? Well, that's a tough question to answer precisely. The, mm-hmm. the, the, Approximately? The, it depends a lot on how you want to um, the ages, read right? the actual psukim and how you want to touch them into English and into math. Uh, on, on a basic level, 600,000 men. Yeah, so that okay. means that you've got to figure out the average size of the family and, and of course, the women. So to the so millions. maybe three million people is, is the figure that's offered. And we know so few of those people. Yeah. That, to me, is not okay. Like, I, I don't feel comfortable with the fact that there was th- over three million people that lived in the times of leaving Mitzrayim, and we just know a few of them. Well, you know, what really bothers me about that is not just the three million people, 
but the fact that that's only supposed to be 20% of the population at the time, the other 80%, right, didn't go. Those are the people I'm especially worried about. And I'm I'm talking now, I'm talking 2022. I'm worried about those 80% of Jews who are out there who, you know, have such a tenuous connection to their Yiddishkeit. And part of the reason why part of the reason the whole reason why i do any of this is because i'm trying to speak to them i'm trying to put something out on the internet that they can get in their homes and they can get on their phones and become part of that connect connection we we conducted an interview yesterday yeah with revitiel goldwicht in israel who's doing incredible work at asia torah and we talked about this specifically for a while yeah yeah how it's how it's our job if we have a platform to reach people yeah and when Mashiach will come and people will be faced with the same choice that the Jews in Egypt were faced with. Yeah. And four-fifths made a certain choice. And it's our job to educate from your vantage point and for us to disseminate from our vantage point and help people make the right choice the next time around. So let me, let me tell you something from a historical perspective mm-hmm. that I think you might appreciate. You know, there, there are about four key moments in Jewish history where we had kind of an inflection point uh, that related to communication technology. Uh, The period when we went from orality to manuscript, right, in times of Yehuda Nasi, when we went from, you know, just having to be physically with a a rabbi to learn the Torah, and then you would would have it, to the point where you actually had text written down. uh, And that tremendously expanded the survivability of Judaism because it made it portable. You could carry the Mishnah and, you know, the tenuous situation of the, the Bar Kokhba revolt and things like that, and who knows what would happen to the Jewish people. Well, we had the Mishnah. We had a written text, and it was controversial, but extremely uh, efficacious at preserving Jewish identity. Then we had another major moment uh, when Gutenberg invented the printing press, Jews were early adopters of that technology. They loved it. In fact, there's some suggestions that the first movable type may have been in Hebrew rather than mm. in uh, you wow. know German Roman letters um, that are coming from Provence. But Jews loved it, and all of a sudden, you could like take hugely expensive, difficult to produce manuscripts, and you could produce much cheaper books. Right, vastly expanding the readership, literacy and allowing a whole new generation of Jews to appreciate their Yiddishkeit rather than disappearing into assimilation, conversion, and so on. And the next big moment, of course, is the Internet. You know, yeah. Since the mid-'90s, all of a sudden, we have this incredible possibility to reach so many people by going digital, and you're participating in that, and, and we're doing that right now. Yeah. We are like taking advantage of this Gutenberg moment to hopefully reach a much larger group of Jews with the message of why you should connect. It's it's a challenge because, you know, there's so much accessibility and there's almost an information overload. Absolutely. There's so much out there. Yeah. So it's, to it really, you have to be, you know, sifting through a lot of, for lack of a better term, Irish guy, to find the things that are of value when it comes to the content. And those complaints were raised with printing as well. People were saying, sure. oh my gosh, if you can print things so cheaply, there's going to be so much garbage on the streets. And there was, you yeah. know, uh, but nevertheless, we still appreciated books. And, you know, the cream rises to the top. We save those books that are still extremely valuable. And hopefully they'll save these podcasts because they're so extremely valuable. Shmuel Sackett joined us once again over Welcome here. Welcome back. Welcome, Thank you. Welcome back. And we're here talking about the Dream Raffle. That's right. Because it's, come on, like it's time. People, if you haven't gotten your tickets already. Or if you bought two tickets, time for that third ticket right now. What you get, yeah, it's you got to get that third ticket. And you know what? There's a great connection to meaningful people. I'll tell oh, you what. Yeah. You guys advertise Turo College a lot, or Turo yes, University. Sure. Yes. Guess where I graduated from in 1982. Interesting. 40 wow. years ago. Wow. I won the David Landon Memorial Award for Excellence in Talmudic and Secular Studies. How wow. are you doing? I made my mother proud. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And now you're raffling off a million dollar that's apartment. That's right. So from Turo to Yerushalayim, doesn't get much better than that. Wow. Yeah, there that's amazing. Is. You could actually take a Turo University course in the apartment. In your new apartment. There it is. Remotely there from Israel. Is. And you know what? If your credit's not good, you can use Bridge Credit Solutions. Bridge Credit Solutions. <laughs> and my wife was the 
Dean Goldschmidt's secretary, and he was interviewed on this show. Wow. wow. So is, there it is. This, this is, is incredible. This is coming full circle. So there it is. So Meaningful People Podcast. You just put in MPP as a promo code. We'll take off $10. We'll double your tickets. Incredible. The dreamraffle.com. A million-dollar apartment in your shrine, but all kidding aside, the money Most also goes. Aside. Right. <laughs> Most, Most kidding, kidding aside. aside. That's a good line. Let's not eliminate all. No, no, we don't want to <laughs> eliminate all. I agree Majority with that. Majority of kidding. Mo- yeah. All right. Uh, the money goes to an amazing thing. For example, one of the projects we support is something called uh, SAR, Search and Rescue, the Israel Dog Unit. They literally have been looking for people. We all know the case of Moishe Kleinemann, who has been missing for, uh, well, now 250 days. And uh, the Israeli police got involved in about day 60. The IDF got involved in about day 140. But this IDU, Israel Dog Unit, with its highly trained dogs, was involved f- from day number three. Wow. And is supported from funds from the Dream Raffle. We're wow. building the first ever search and rescue center in the Mehron area from funds from the Dream Raffle. So, go ahead. so there yeah. it is, thedreamraffle.com. It goes to an amazing thing. It could help uh, find missing Jews, save their lives, win an apartment, double your uh, uh, tickets, and Use save, promo code right, MPP, MPP and you'll save yourself some, save yourself some money. Guys, go ahead, thedreamraffle.com. Now back to this episode. I want to zero in on that remark that you sort of off the cuff just made that the similar complaints were lodged against the the printing press. Yeah. And, you know, people know the phrase history repeats itself. But I think as folks grow up and they encounter challenges, people experience it as if it's unique to them, it's unique to our generation. And I think you're able to shed a lot of le- a light on how this is history repeating itself. This is not a new problem. No, it's, it's not a new problem at all. As, as my father would like to say, uh, the more it changes, the more it stays the same. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the challenge uh, with the, the 15th and 16th century in particular was that people thought books were ugly. That, uh, you know, you, you've seen uh, Miguel Sester, of course, you've seen Torah scrolls. Beautiful, you know, they're works of art. You can see the personality in them. You can can feel the text and you can imagine the sofa actually investing himself in writing the letters. It's it's a beautiful thing. It's objet d'art. But books were like, you know, they're 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 crude, they're printed in the hundreds, maybe thousands, and they're like they weren't considered very valuable at all. In fact, that's one of the reasons why uh, Western Europe, Christian Europe surged ahead of the Muslim world is because the Muslims had a very well developed art of calligraphy. And they said, what is this? I want to use an appropriate word here, but can I use a Yiddish word? No, I better not. <laughs> but, you know, they said, what, what, what kind of stuff is this? We're not going with printing. And so the Muslims held back about 100 years from the new technology of printing. And by that time, in just one century, the Christian Europe had a huge technological advantage because all this knowledge could circulate so much easier. Wow. So that's the kind of challenges that, that, that we face today with the Internet. There are some people who say, there's so much dangerous, awful stuff on there. It's like not even non-aesthetic. It's dangerous and nasty, which is true. Um, but the it's not going away, and it is extremely valuable. So we've got to figure out how to focus on the valuable stuff. Uh, one thing, if I can just bend your ear one more second. One sure. of the things that I really, uh, you know, I, I am a transitional generation person, right? I was born in the 1960s, so... I remember what life was like before the internet very well because it was my years of emerging adulthood and so on. And to give you one example, you know, to write my dissertation, you know, to, if you wanted to read something in a foreign language, you had to learn that language. Mm. Then you had to like go to the country where that book was held. And then you had to like sift through these, I have to describe them to my undergraduates, they, these things called card catalogs which were like massive chests of drawers with little tiny index cards that listed every single book on one card. And if you ever pulled it out too far, the, 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 the whole drawer would fall on the ground and be cards everywhere. Something I remember with great embarrassment I did in Kiev once. Oh my gosh. And, uh, uh, and like, it was like incredibly difficult to read all this stuff, physically difficult in travel and time, that uh, I think at some point the, the supervisors just said, oh, you know, he's worked so hard, give him the doctorate already. But <laughs> nowadays, you know, it, it's not at all about the difficulty of accessing information. It's, it's on my phone, you know. Literally, I can, yeah. Yeah, and so, like, nowadays, scholars and, and people in general have to learn a whole new different set of skills. 
in my day, you got credit just for finding out facts. Go find these facts. You find enough of them, put them together, you win. Nowadays, it's all about filtering out facts. Mm. Way too many facts. I, I need to learn how to edit. I need to learn how to you know focus. So I like to think of this as the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And I think that my generation has a deep responsibility to try and provide, as weak as we are, some measure of wisdom to younger people so they understand properly that the, the internet appears flat, like everything is all equal, but it's not at all flat. There are you know, huge mountains of value that stand right beside the, the cesspools of dangerous misinformation. Wow. And you have to figure out, how am I going to find the mountain to climb? I don't even know what it looks like. Wow. Our, our Rav in North Woodmere, Shmuel Weinberg, Shlita, he, he says over the Svar Makdashim characterize a Talmud Chacham with a Bechina of Shabbos. And they elaborate on, on what mm -hmm. the equation is. Yeah. He says that back in the day, a Talmud Chacham was someone that knew a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot yeah. of Torah. Good memory. He says today, yeah. with access to information on our phone, you can see a true Talmud Chacham only on Shabbos when there's uh -huh. no ability to Google anything. That's it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, and it's also, by the way, a challenge for teachers and uh, professors. I mean, I could never fact check my professors when they were talking. <laughs> and nowadays, you know, you give a lecture and you sit. So vulnerable. Yeah, that's right. So everything has to be very different in how you present it. Yeah. The the PSS now. Ah, okay. It's it's uh, like a wave, a wave that's come over the five towns over the last, I don't know. Not just the five towns. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I probably it's probably other places. That was oh, very yeah. very small minded of me to say. <laughs> just no, the five towns. You're giving credit to Moshe Weinberger for, for sure. Moshe Weinberger and, and, and you know at Kodesh and Kalmabak Hashem and this just wave of Hasidus and, and and about the PSS now and that's a an area in, in which you studied and and you and you wrote about. Yeah. What what uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, the one thing that I really love to tell you, I'm not sure it's true, but it makes me feel so good. <laughs> I'd like to say it anyway. Someone told me in shul the other day that he was speaking with Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, who is, of course, one of the world experts on P.S. National Hasidus. And um, he wrote uh, one of the haskamos for my book on, on the Rebbe, and, and I really appreciated that. But apparently this person said, and I, I, I'm, I know that people in the five towns will hear this, so you'll get you know probably comments <laughs> to say, no, it's not true, but I like it anyways. <laughs> Don't show me those comments. Uh, apparently, well, it'll, be part, it'll be part of the misinformation. They have to sift through. It's fine. <laughs> nice. So the uh, this person told me that he was in a shir with Rabbi Weinberger, and Rabbi Weinberger said that it is asr to learn the Eish Kodesh without Abramson's book. Oh wow! Oh. Oh, I know, I know. Can I say that again? It is asr <laughs> to learn. Yeah. So I mean, I think we need to start imposing some penalties on Judaica Plus and the, the, the Judaica stories. They need to, if someone's going to try getting a different book that's to learn the PSS, no, it's not. They, they stock it downstairs, but it's kind of a hassle because I, I self-published it on Amazon yeah. and uh, it's just way easier to use the internet, but um, it's kind of a hassle to get it if you're a store. But let me, let me tell you what I yes, did please. that I think, if it's true, uh, would have motivated Rabbi Weinberger to write that. He did write a very nice Haskama. Um, the... Shall I, I give some background on the P.S. Session Rebbe for sure, you? Yeah, sure. So, so uh, the P.S. Session Rebbe is uh, Rabbi Kalonimus Kama Shapira. He um, was born in 1889, and he was martyred in the Holocaust in 1943. Uh, his claim to fame before the war is a remarkable series of books, one of which was published in his lifetime called Chovas Talmidim, in which he had a, a really radical take on what was happening in Eastern European Jewish society. He felt, he actually prognosticated, he was, he was quite prophetic in this sense, he felt that it was growing static and, and it was headed for a massive clash with modernity. Of course, it came faster than he anticipated with the Holocaust, but he felt that Eastern European Hasidic Jewry was in a state of deep decline and has, something had to be done to reverse that decline. It was becoming too obsessed with particulars of you know, my Rebbe is better than your Rebbe, and uh, my Strymel is taller than your Strymel. And he felt that this was, it was like getting away from spirituality, and we have to get back to basics. So he wrote this book 
that was part of a series. The other books were eventually discovered after the war and published. Uh, the Chovas Talmudim is essentially how to be a 12-year-old. And he's, he wants to start with youth. And by the way, it's deep, fascinating material that, that I reread frequently and, you know, makes me want to at least reach that level. Yeah, Halavai, we should all be the Chavis right. Talmudim's 12-year-olds. Oh my gosh, yeah. But it's written with tremendous humanity and understanding of children and, and you know, it's, it's deeply moving work. Um, and he then wrote a series of other books for like 17-year-olds and then 22-year-olds uh, to try and guide people along a path of spiritual development from their youth. Uh, there's so much more to say about that. He also wrote a secret book that was later, he, he wouldn't even have it printed in Poland. He sent the manuscript to Jerusalem to be published in Yerushalayim. Like some of the Hasidic printers used to actually immerse the movable type in a mikvah before they printed certain books. Why? Because the, the Kedusha of what they really? were saying. I mean, you, this microphone how many holy people have sat here and have said tremendous things that have changed lives? I mean, it would probably break the mic, but we could try. You know? <laughs> <sighs> anyway, so, uh, but the, the work that I worked on specifically, I do have another book forthcoming, God willing, on uh, something in Chovos Talmudim, but my, the work that I published that uh, I, I think has made something of an impact is um, based on his Holocaust writings. He was trapped in the Warsaw Ghetto, and um, one of the most remarkable things that he did was that he continued, despite the bans from the Nazis, despite the dangers, the epidemics, the starvation, he continued to have Farbrengens with his Hasidim, which included, by the way, there's good indications that a lot of you know, non-Hasidim began to be attracted to his tish. Free thinkers, atheists, everyone wanted to hear some words of support and comfort and chizuk from the Rebbe. And um, he would write down his notes from what he said that particular week. And then when the, the underground society called Oneg Shabbos in the ghetto, uh, run by the remarkable historian Emanuel Ringelblum, said, you know, the, the, the ghetto is going to be destroyed. We have to preserve these documents now. Uh, all of the people who were involved with collecting documentation on the, the ghetto life, they wrote their, their last wills and they buried them in three caches in Warsaw. Um, one of them, uh, some survivors went back to in 1946. They dug it up, but unfortunately all the documents were ruined because they used these tin boxes and there was water damage. Uh, the other two were lost. Uh, there was no survivors who remembered where they were uh, until December 1, 1950, when a Polish construction worker digging up the rubble of the ghetto came across two sealed milk containers. These were like big tin containers that were like, you know, about... Uh, eight, ten liters in size, and inside it were the writings of the P.S. Session Rebbe. Wow. They're like chilling, chilling documents. Um, so they were translated, brought to Israel, translated, in, uh, sorry, not translated, they were published in 1960 under the title Eish Kodesh. It's not the title he used. Uh, the editors added that, meaning Holy Fire. The title he used was Chidushe um, Torah Mishnos Zaam, Tafshin, Tafshin Al, Tafshin Beis. Uh, the uh, you know, Chidushe Torah, my Torah thoughts, as it were, from the years of wrath, sometimes translated the years of rage, 1939 to 1942. And um, so... And it was the editors that selected Eish Kodesh as correct, the title? Correct, correct. Wow. It's not an unfitting title, but the words do not occur anywhere in, his, uh, in that book. There is one phrase in another book that survived, um, but it's in a different context altogether. But it is a, you know, that's what he's, he's called now the Aish Kodesh based on that title. It's so divine that like this, this, these articles were buried and weren't discovered for, for decades. Yeah. And then in 1950, like it's not, it's not, uh, it's not the 1700s, not the 1800s. In 1950, d dug up by a construction worker in Poland. Yeah. That construction worker in Poland who his job was to dig up dirt. What, what did he do? What was his chus wow, to, yeah. bring, wow, to, to bring that Torah to the world? No, Can you imagine? I want to know who that is. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like s three million Jews, the Sias and Sraim, this construction worker, who is he? Yeah. And more than that, the fact that when he opened it and he saw Hebrew writing, he said, you know what? Uh, I better find someone Jewish to give this to. Right. You know, and he, they, eventually they made their way to the, 
the uh, Jewish historical archives and um, like Abramson, you're you're an historian. You need to find who this this construction worker was. <laughs> okay, I, I, challenge. Yeah, challenge. I, it's a big challenge. I think I know who would know though. Probably, <laughs> probably there's there's a, an amazing young scholar uh, named uh, Matan Shalom in Israel who's writing a biography right now, and uh, my colleague, of course, Daniel Reiser, who wrote a phenomenal critical edition, uh, two volumes of the Ish College. They would know. But let me tell you what's uh, really cool about the, the cool, that's an appropriate word. Let me tell you what's really, um, I think, useful of the, my small contribution sure. to the PS session study. So the Aish Kodesh, published in 1960, uh, people are like fascinated. Oh my gosh, here it is. The only book of its kind, uh, Drashos offered every week in the ghetto through the entire Nazi occupation. We get to see, you know, uh, what what it meant to Jews in the ghetto at that time. We'll learn so much about, you know, uh, theology and the Holocaust and things like that. And it was like a, a bust because the Rebbe never in his books mentions the words Nazi, the war, Germans. You know, if you picked up this book and didn't know where it came from, you'd say, well, this is like a really depressing work of 19th century Hasidus. He's constantly going back to the question of, you know, uh, how could God allow these things to happen and offering different suggestions, solutions. Uh, but it's like, it, it, it's like unfixed in time and you have no way of understanding what are we going to learn from this. So it tended to be the realm only of theologians and it did not get anywhere near the attention it deserved. My small contribution is, that um, and I, I, we don't have a lot of time, but I, my story with it, I think, is is like why I'm studying Peter Session Casitas is interesting too. But let me tell you the cool thing, and then we got to go on. Um, what I did was, as a historian, I said, okay, let me go back and let me read everything I can about what happened in the ghetto every week, street by street, specific events, specific dates, specific addresses, specific people, and I will like skiing. You know how I tried to learn how the disabled skiers would appreciate the snow? So I tried to put myself in the streets at 5 Zielna Street uh, and imagine I'm going to the Rebbe's Russia and all the things that happened this week. I made myself as aware as possible of everything that happened, reading journals, newspapers, memoirs, anything I could find, Nazi documentation, and then walking into the Rebbe's uh, study and then reading the drusha or hearing the drusha. And all of a sudden, everything opened up. The Rebbe was not uh, obfuscating. He actually was addressing the specific things that happened in the ghetto. But he was only speaking in Parsha. He was talking about things that happened to the Avos. But everyone in the audience knew, oh my gosh, he's referring to the fact that you know, there were 200 people arrested and then shot in the street yesterday. Everybody knew that there's a, a, a rumor that the Nazis are losing on the Western Front. And when the Rebbe is speaking, all of a sudden you could understand what he was trying to say to his gathered Hasidim and Talmidim about how they're supposed to frame the events of the day within the Torah perspective. He never cheapens it by saying, so I know you're thinking about what happened in the newspaper this week. Right. I'm going to talk Torah, and then you can understand why the Torah is directly, immediately relevant to our lives here in the Warsaw Ghetto, week by week. And, and I, I mean, I have to say, I, I agree with Rabbi Weinberger, if he said it, if it's true. <laughs> you can't read the, the Eish Kodesh without knowing what happened in the ghetto, because the, the Rebbe sort of, if you compare his drushes from before the war to what he wrote in the war, he obviously threw all that aside and said, I'm going to just focus on Chumash Rashi, and try to give people chizuk for their lives. He was, you know, I don't want to make light of it, he was the, the meaningful minute for everyone trying to say, you need chizuk, I'm going to give it to you. This is a really hard time. 150 people dying a day, their corpses have to be picked up off the street. You know, you need chizuk, I'm going to tell you what the Torah says. Wow, and you're bringing that historical context to everyone. Yeah. Without so it, it's like having a, having a lock without the key. Like, Yeah, you can't get in. Right. You know, is, what, what, what is it all about? You pulled back. You were about to go down a road. I think of, of your personal interest in the the Piasets and his Torah and, and his life. I would invite you to elaborate on that. Oh, okay, thank you. Because, <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Um, 
my first uh, engagement with the Pia Session Rebbe was in uh, the the early '90s when I was at Or Sameach, Yeshiva Or Sameach, and uh, this is when you know coming closer to Torah and, and Yiddishkeit, by the way, which was all my wife's doing. She was the one who was like saying, hey, you know, okay, we're married now. We've got to, you know, invest in, in our Judaism. And so we ended up spending a year in Yerushalayim. And, um, you know, I was, a, I was a difficult student because I thought I was way smarter than I was. And uh, they had to placate me with uh, little tidbits here and there. So one of the things that was actually really nice is Rabbi Nachman Bullman, who was a great scholar and uh, um, a brilliant student at Bias Central Hasidus. He pulled three or four of us out of one of the shiurim and would bring them into his kitchen once a week. Uh, his wife would be preparing the chill into the next room, which made it very distracting for us to actually learn. <laughs> but we would go through the three deeply Kabbalistic essays, the Shloshim Amarim, at the end of Chovas Talmidim. I mentioned it was a book written for 12-year-olds. He appended to the end this mind-blowing set of three Kabbalistic essays that are essentially what the whole universe is about and what Judaism is about, why we're doing this, like really deep, meaningful stuff. Uh, one of the Hasidic movements said, you know, we love your book, but we, we would like to publish it without necessarily those three, part- oh, sorry, not Hasidic group, it was a Litvish group, that said, we'd like to publish it without those three essays at the end because we don't think 12-year-olds should be reading this. And he said, no way. You have to publish the whole thing with those. They're there for a reason because I want them to know that there's someplace else you're going to go to that's mind-blowing. And by the way, now we think about it, uh, the Piasechna Rebbe's go-to technique for spiritual growth was a kind of visualization, which is ironically not that different from what I was trying to do with skiing. Uh, you got to read those essays. They're mind-blowing. So uh, that's how I first started learning Piasechna Hasidus. Um, not the, I didn't know anything about the Eish Kodesh, about the Holocaust works. And when I came to Miami, I had a Hebrusa named Shlomo Ackerman, and uh, the two of us studied the entire corpus of Pia Session Rebbe's writings. And uh, we decided to spend um, about eight years writing a manuscript, a translation of Eish Kodesh, with a commentary. And uh, we worked on it, worked on it. Uh, in the end, I moved away from there, but I, I had a 500-page manuscript that was ready to go to publishers. And a uh, colleague of mine, Gershon Greenberg, one of the world's great experts on Holocaust theology, has written quite a few books. He says, oh, Abramson, I met him at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and he said, uh, I hear you're working on the Eish Kodesh. Uh, have you had a look at the manuscript? You know, because I was working with the printed version. I said, no. He says, oh, well, look, I made a photocopy of it for me when I was at, uh, at um, Yad Vashem. Here it is. And he gave me the manuscript, and I looked at it, and my heart sank because I realized that the difference between the printed text and the manuscript was so great that I had to throw away my manuscript. Eight wow. years of work. Oh, wow. Out the window. Defenestrated. What's that? Take us into that, that the emotional reason is, feeling there. Like, oh, it was crushing. It was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I cannot move. But, <laughs> Shimon Am Sunni, the Gemara says. Oh, uh, yeah, he says, yeah. The action all Essen in the Torah. And, and I, I just like there's a value in the Prisha. You know, or in the Drisha, there's also value in the Prisha. I'll get Skar. Beautiful. This is such an intellectual group. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so why why did I have to toss it aside? First of all, I should tell you why I had to toss it aside was because when you look at the manuscript, like when you look at the printed version, right? All you see are the words marching across the page, one after the other. You know, it seems like it's all logical, makes sense, and so on. When you look at the actual manuscript, he's you see a torment. You see a mind that is struggling actively. How do I explain this to my Talmudim? He's crossing things out. He's, he's writing words in the margins. He's crossing a word out, writing over it, crossing that word out again. He's, he's like, uh, even in some cases, excising pieces from the text, cutting it out with scissors, and then pasting in a blank section over it. And, and even the, the characterization of it, there's one point where he writes his own name on the title page of one of his books, and he writes underneath it, and, and my colleague Daniel Reiser has really done the great work on this, um, he writes underneath it his title of the Av based in Piasechna. And then there's these violent X's all over his title, like he's angry and frustrated, as if to say, if my Hasidim are dead, how can I be a Rebbe? 
you know. So looking at the actual Ksav, uh, there's a wealth of information there that means anything I wrote on the printed text is valueless. And so I had to start all over again. Wow. Another yeah. And so the, the way, book no? that's out now is the is the second version. The first version is gone. Is it gone gone? Like <laughs> I have it in an actual floppy disk if you remember oh, those. Wow. I don't think we yeah. can put that in anywhere. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's worthless. It's that's, it's not worth it. To apply the violent X's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I included those things. Well, not not to matter. I included photographs in my book so you could see what I'm talking about when you actually look at the text. But if you're serious about studying P. Session of and H. Kodesh in particular, you have to use Daniel Reiser's two-volume edition where he spent the hard work of actually uh, decrypting his, his very cramped handwriting and transliterating it and making it available. It's so amazing that there's so much you can learn from the, the, the stuff that we white out, the stuff that we replace and cross out and X. It's like, that's why you need to, you need to work off the manuscript. Yes. It speaks volumes. Absolutely. In an era where everyone's excited that the new iMessage uh, iOS allows you to erase <laughs> it like WhatsApp, like it just as if it's gone. You should call yeah. it an iOS. iOS, yeah. iOS? People don't say iOS? I, I don't think I so. I don't think I've ever said that word <laughs> either way. Uh, I guess this is what happens when you don't have it. The, <laughs> That's a, wow. Momo, you may never live that down. All it's right. Okay. I, I'll take it. I mispronounced Apple the might word. Sue you. I will always take on the brunt of not being like technologically. I'm okay with it. No, it's okay. I, 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 um, I mispronounced the word reverberated for about 15 years in public lectures until someone had the kindness to walk up to me and say, you know, it's not reverberate. Oh. And, uh, okay. It happens. Don't worry. Yeah. People might come over to you about it, but you'll just... IOS will be my reverb. IOS, yes. <laughs> that That is really, really um, incredible stuff. And I, I look forward to sort of delving into this conversation. It inspired me to delve into that. I want to ask you uh, one more thing and then we'll we'll wind down. Um, is there a, you know, a part of history or personality in history that, that evokes emotion in you, that will get you emotional, that you, you could sit there... Learning and it, it'll move you to tears. And what is that or who is that? Well, I don't know. We have a video on, but I was nearly at tears when we were talking about a bae. Okay, we're just close for a minute there. But, but, that's, um, but like, I love that, no, by the way. It's I, so I think, amazing. Um, um, th there is one particular figure that I, I focus on probably more than I should. And actually, we're coming up to Yomi Narayim. I often think about him about this, uh, about this time of year as well. It, he's uh, an individual named Uriel da Costa. You heard that name before? No. Uh, it's, he's a figure, I think, for our age. I think everybody in the 21st century should think about Uriel da Costa. Um, five minutes? Sure. Can I devote five minutes to this? Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, he was born probably around the year 1499 or 1500 in Portugal. Um, at that time, the... Uh, the Jews living there had been forcibly converted to Catholicism. This is right after the Spanish Inquisition and the, uh, the expulsion of Jews from Spain. Portugal took a slightly different approach. Rather than uh, expelling the Jews, they simply mass converted them. Very coercive kind of measure and so on. But the king at the time, Manuel I, had said, listen, I I'm going to do this. I have my political reasons for it. He wanted to have a union with Spain and things like that. Mary, the, uh, the princess of Spain. Uh, but I'm not going to bring the Inquisition in, okay? So you guys, we're going to call you Christians, okay, but you can basically do your own thing. Um, and then that ended brutally with an Inquisition that was far more harsh than even the Spanish Inquisition that is, you know, proverbial in its, its, uh, its brutality. Um, so like many kids of his generation, uh, he was brought up with his parents intentionally hiding his Jewish identity because it's dangerous, right? If you're a, if you're a five-year-old, you go out and play with the other kids and say, hey, you know, my mother makes a delicious challah for Shabbos. That could result in, in a horrible retribution for the entire family in, uh, right up to capital punishment. So he, he went to the University of Coimbra. He got a degree in theology. He was always a very spiritual kind of guy. Uh, he was a Catholic priest. And then his mother tells him, uh, guess what, Uriel? I, the truth is we're Jewish. And I'm telling you now, about 22 years old, 
I'm telling you now because I found a way for us to get out of Portugal. We're going to move to Amsterdam, which is a very liberal city, and we can resume our Jewish identity. Uh, Uriel is elated. He says, wow, <laughs> I, I can't believe it. You know, I've been reading the Bible because there's no Hebrew books allowed. Only doctors are allowed to possess Hebrew books in Portugal because, you know, they have special medical expertise, lots of Hebrew textbooks on medicine. Otherwise, there's no rabbis, no Torah Shabbat whatsoever, no art scroll, nothing. Mm-hmm. And and he's only been reading the, 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 the Hebrew scriptures as they're included in Christian Bibles, right? So that's why, for example, a lot of uh, Sephardim, especially those who went through the Inquisition, they're, they're, they hold very tight to the fast of Esther. Uh, there are even customs of them st- of fasting for three days in a row, like it is in the fast of Esther, because that was available to them. They could read it, and they say, we're going to do it. He ends up, uh, they move to Amsterdam, and he says, I'm a Jew. <laughs> I love it. And he joins the shul, and he learns, and he's like so deeply into it. Uh, and then he starts becoming a problem to the community. He starts saying to people, you know, excuse me, isn't that Lashon Hara? And he starts saying, wait, did you actually bench? I can't believe you benched. That was like so fast. And he starts like criticizing other Jews, saying, how can you be behaving? like? Don't you know who you are? You know, you're B'nai Avram, Yitzchak for Yaakov, the uh, Avos and the Imaos, and you're behaving, you're cheating in business, and you're doing this. And he becomes kind of a gadfly to the community. Wow. Um, he is put into harem three times wow. by the Rabbanim. They say, you got to stop this, Uriel. You got to stop it. Mm. He gets wor- he gets worse and worse because he becomes someone who has adopted a Jewish identity because he has a picture in his mind of ideal Jews, and the reality of actual Jews doesn't live up to what he expects of them. Mm. Huh. This, by the way, has a very sad ending. You know, I hope that uh, you're prepared for that. I don't want to bring down the meaningful minimum. I, I don't know how I could prepare for it, but let's prepare. Okay. So uh, he actually he he leaves Amsterdam and tries to make a a life in a different town. He feels alienated, and he says, you know, I, I can't help it. Uh, even though I, uh, I'm, I'm at odds with the community, and I feel they're not living up to what I think Judaism should be. He wrote books about it. He was actually, you know, it was not a small deal. He was, he was actually saying things about the community that other people could read. It was upsetting. He goes back to Amsterdam and says, you know, I, I, can't, I can't live on my own. I, I have to be in the Jewish community. What do I have to do to be accepted? So they said to him, all right, we've already gone through this several times now. In order for you to be accepted back in the community, you have to go through a ritual humiliation, which is something that was actually done much more commonly than you know. Uh, You have to come to shul. You have to confess before the entire kahila will be assembled in this process. You will be symbolically whipped in shul, right? Like they would take a a thin thread and or like a, a shoelace kind of thing and whip them. Uh, and then you have to lie down at the front of the shul, and every single member of the shul will walk over your prone form as they leave the shul. Well, that is awful. It's worse. He does it, goes through the whole thing. He says, I have, to, I have to live among the Jewish community. He does it. He goes through the entire experience. He goes home afterwards. He writes a 12-page suicide note, and he takes his own life. And his suicide note, which, is, which was discovered and published, called Exemplar Humanae Vitae, the example of a human life, describes you know, how he, he wants so badly to find his place in Judaism, and he wants so badly for, for Jews to live up to their Jewish identity, and he was unsuccessful in the end. He couldn't manage it. Now, there's a lot more to the story that I can give you in this short period of time. But I believe that Oriol da Costa faced a very early version of the kind of challenges of modernity, where we as Jews were no longer forced to live in ghettos. We're no longer to force, even though the five towns as a ghetto is actually pretty nice. <laughs> you know, there's kosher restaurants, everything, things like that. But we're volunteering to be in the ghetto, right? But we're also, you know, engaged in the outside world. And how do we draw those boundaries? How do we find our liminal identities in this very amorphous space where there is no clear distinction between secular culture and Jewish culture. You can easily, you know, flow from one thing to another on the internet. And, and we have to work out the problems that Oriel da Costa could not work out if we we're to survive this unusual moment in our history. Wow. <clears throat> wow. That is a very powerful message indeed. Well, thank you. As, as you started down 
the road of this particular personality, it occurred to me that <clears throat> I think a lot of our listeners are female. And I'm wondering if there's any woman in history that you also find doesn't get enough press. And wow, that's so them. many. My gosh. Uh, yeah, I, well, there, there's a couple of, uh, there's many obvious characters. I think one of the, my favorites, the one that comes to mind right now, I would actually, I would talk about Berenice in the ancient period because I'm writing right now in the ancient period, but maybe more important for most of our readers because a new critical edition just came out is uh, Glickel of Hamelin. Heard of this woman? It's a great, great, amazing woman, really. So she was born in the late 1500s as well, uh, a little later than Uriel de Costa. She was born in... Uh, Northern Germany in uh, Altona, I believe, or maybe it was Hamburg. Anyways, she has a, a pretty difficult life, multiple husbands, uh, divorce, uh, death, actually no divorce, death, child custody issues, all kinds of things like that. And uh, towards the end of her life, her, her kids say to her, you know, she's alone. They say, you know, you know, mommy, maybe you should like keep a diary. And so she ends up writing like seven volumes uh, the story of her life, uh, and uh, the new edition is is called Glickel. I can't remember the name of the the editor, but it's an improved edition over the uh, the original translation. And it's a Yiddish memoir of a woman's life in the late 1500s and early 1600s. There is nothing like this in European wow. history. Period. I mean, they have an inside view as to her life and. My gosh, she is amazing. She's just like a regular woman, right? And she's saying, I'm writing these stories because I'm kind of depressed and I want to like, you know, my kids suggest it. So I thought, why not? And she's got like a platinum backbone and she just gets into the fight. And you see that she's, you know, she, she her, when her husband dies, she has to take over their international import-export business and she's dealing with unsavorable characters and she, she sends her kids out for tutors and the tutors steal the silver buttons off their coats and Aye. for themselves. And she's like, and she's writing about her quotidian, regular concerns about a, a Jewish mother. And there are two words, by the way, that occur more than anything else in the entire book. One is shiduchim. Right? She's very <laughs> concerned about the Shidiochim. And the second is the word Reichstaler, which means a uh, dollar. Right? Yeah. So she's very concerned about money. How do you make ends meet? Shidiochim and money. That's where you know, what? It's pretty contemporary, right? Yeah. yeah. Hundreds of years later and we're yeah. still with it. So a, a reading Glickel of Hamelin is is uh, absolutely fantastic. When's the and movie coming Tremes out? Kizik. It deserves a movie, actually. Glickel. I think it's called Glickel. Yeah. Boom. Let's, let's, I think we're going to, I think we knew someone is going to produce right, it. Stissel. We're going to, we're going to produce it. Dr. Abramson, you are a Dean at our favorite college. Oh, thank you. I also like to say it's God's favorite college. Is it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, that's it. I, th I think I heard Robbie Weinberger say, no, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> yeah, why not? We're adding things that he said. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, you know, in a day where, where, I don't know if less people are going to college or less people are considering, you know, it's people think, Hey, I could just jump in and experience the importance of your position at, at as a Dean at Turo university and you know what, what it's like there. Well, Turo is great. They I offer mean, more. Yeah. Turo. Is, There's more at Turo. Turo is, <laughs> Turo is absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, when Dr. Landers, that's all asked me to join the Turo family. Uh, I was a little hesitant because at that time, my life was kind of like on a, a research distinguished professor kind of track, you know, where I was, I, Baruch Hashem, I had the opportunity to study at some of the world's greatest universities. And Turo, you know, w was much, was still pretty big, but yeah. it was much more focused on the Jewish world. At least that's what I thought about it. And the truth is, it actually has a massive uh, population of non Jewish students as well because of the dual mission of the university. But, um, you know, I was taken in by Dr. Lanner's incredible passion and his vision. He was someone who saw the world very clearly, and that's someone who, you know, and he deeply inspired me as saying, no, you know, or if I can paraphrase the Torah, uh, the paraphrase in Talmud, you know, you have the famous story with Reish Lakish and, uh, and, um, Rabbi Yochanan. and Rabbi Yochanan, thank you, that uh, Rabbi Yochanan says to Reish Lakish, you know, and you can translate it, Orisa is Torah. Your power is for the Torah. It belongs for the Torah. And if we can mispronounce it and say, <laughs> then we can, right? So he was the one who convinced the marketing, me. The marketing team is, their brains are rolling right now. Okay, that's, that's a good great. one. We're, we're going to roll with that. Um, so uh, Turo is deeply inspirational. You know, having worked at, at Harvard and, and 
Oxford and and uh, Hebrew University and Cornell, I I can tell you that uh, you know some of the great secular universities of the world. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenging academic politics, and uh, we have our fair share of those, like every university. But at Turo University, there's actually very very little. For example, Lashon Hara. We actually care about each other a lot, and we are, we are all devoted to the mission in, in a, to a degree that I've never seen at any other university. So that's like deeply meaningful to me. Um, in terms of like, why should students go to college? Well, th- there are a couple of really good reasons. One is Reichsthaler. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> One is that there's no question that the statistics are overwhelming. Higher education. It translates into higher salaries, uh, greater income earning potential. Even if you're an entrepreneur, uh, you know, the things that you can learn in college are really so much more useful for uh, your pragmatics. And we really focus on that mm. at, at the university. The but other thing is Shaduchim. Shaduchim, <laughs> that's true. Actually, <laughs> I didn't think of that. So wait, we're still living Glickel's dream, right? Yeah. Shaduchim, <laughs> and you can get a, a degree like an MRS and things like that. But the other, uh, the other thing is that, I look, I believe that people intrinsically enjoy learning. I believe mm-hmm. that learning is actually fun. Uh, people think they don't like studying because they've had bad experiences with uh, unfortunate instructors who have made it boring and tedious. But learning, you know, it's it's worthwhile. Look, if you're still on this podcast at this point, <laughs> you're probably yeah. someone who's realized that learning is interesting. Uh, and that's why I think that higher education is really of, of great value. And at Turo University, we try hard to imbue our faculty with that same value so that they can transmit to the students that love of learning uh, lishma. Obviously, uh, you know, we have in some of our divisions, like, like in Queens and Manhattan, we have like strong Judaic studies programs where it is really learning lishma. But even in those divisions where we really focus on the Reichsthaler, you know, it's still as, as, uh, Dr. Landru put it, it's um, it's Parnassa al Taharas Kodesh. It's getting your livelihood, but done in a sanctified manner. And, and I consider it a tremendous privilege. Very grateful to Akadosh Baruch Hu for, for giving me the opportunity to work for such a phenomenal institution. Dr. Abramson, Abramson, thank you so much for giving us your time and your wisdom. Oh, wisdom. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> it was a great pleasure. I especially enjoyed trying on your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to send me a clip of that so yes, I can see absolutely. what they look like. Thank that was you. the easiest part of my day. <laughs> my pleasure. Okay. Thank you so much. So I have a challenge for those who just listened to this episode. If you can find out who that Polish guy wow. who was digging in the mud wow. found the tire of the PSS now, uh, that's my life mission now. Sorry, folks. I'm, I'm, I'm going on sabbatical. I'm going to Poland to find out who that guy was. And uh, I'm going to become a historian myself. You can call me Dr. Nachi Gordon. Nachi's all in. I am. Doctor. Um, But I'm probably not going to leave you guys. I would never do that Um, because we got so much more to do here. We have many more episodes coming your way of Meaningful People Podcast. Please go ahead and leave a rating, a review. And remember to head to MeaningfulMinute.org to to take part in this Be Kind week. Because even if you feel like you don't want to be kind because you just don't want to be kind, you probably want your kids to be kind. Or you probably want your siblings to be kind. Well, and good luck with that if you're not willing to be kind. I know, but it's, you know, like, instead of leading by example, all you have to do is just get Be Kind merch. <laughs> like, that's the new thing. I'm kidding. Lead by example. Be a good role model. Be kind. Hold open the door for somebody. Give somebody a compliment. Challenge yourself to, like, triple the amount of compliments you give someone wow. each day. So if you give four a day, you know, try to give 12. Look at that math on the spot. Wow. That's awesome. And uh, rise by lifting others. Yes. Um, that's what we do. We sell jetpacks also at MeaningfulMinute.org where you go rise when you lift others. Mm. That, that fell flat a little bit. Feel free to give uh, Naki <laughs> feedback on whether that line went flat or not. Yeah. But either way, be kind. Be kind. So be kind. We look forward to hearing your feedback. You can go ahead and email us at MeaningfulPeoplePodcast at gmail.com or you could call Momo's direct phone at 917-842-6189. We'll see you later. It's worthwhile to clarify that that is not my number. Did you make that number up? I've been texting that number. Okay. Who who is that then? <laughs> it's not you. It, wow. Oh man. If that's your number, I apologize on Nahi's behalf. Sorry. <laughs>